Coming up on Chasing the Natty, we're through week three of the 2023 CFF season and things are really only just getting started. Some of you are wondering how you're going to turn your teams around, while others want to make sure that the success that you've seen so far will continue down the stretch. As always, I'll cover a few trap players to avoid on the waiver wire this week, and then we'll be discussing who you should actually be targeting to help your teams in another round of waiver wire pickups. All this and more coming right after this. Junior touchdown! Marvelous Mark! Ball next to the outside! Drop down for Franklin! Oh, majestic! Touchdown! This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everybody. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Monday morning. We are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus to Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all of your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday and Wednesday morning during the season at 6 a.m. sharp. If you want to support the great work we are doing here, head on over to campusofcanton.com and subscribe there with one R bar. Uh, what's a word I could go with here today? I go fantabulous and amazing all the time. I don't know, just really, really cool tiers. Again, they, you'll find everything you need there for your CFF, Devi, and C2C needs, including rankings, articles, including my waiver wire article this week, tools, and even more than that. You can also find me and the show on Twitter. I am at CFF underscore Jared, and the show is at Chasing the Natty. Y'all, can you believe it? We're basically a quarter of the way through the season already like isn't that just absolutely nuts i know a lot of y'all play nfl then you know there's there's 17 weeks of that so it feels like it just goes on for absolutely forever sometimes but like college fantasy we're already a quarter of the way through here three weeks in the books here we got 10 weeks in the regular season obviously if you play in most leagues that leaves pretty much oh i don't know doing quick math off the top of my head about six seven weeks of um or actually no probably about seven to eight weeks left to actually get your teams into the playoffs so obviously you know a lot of that time's already kind of gone out the window so you're probably sitting there wondering like depending on where you are like how are you going to make sure you end up getting into the playoffs for your teams down the stretch well obviously the big thing here as we discuss on this show every single week is the waiver wire and really like one thing i just want to get into before we get started here today is i just want to reiterate to everybody out there that the waiver wire continues to be in college fantasy football the most important thing to utilize during the season i do not care if you are zero and three so far i do not care if you're three and zero so far you have to be paying attention to the waiver wire you cannot at any point give up on paying attention to that you cannot if if you are 0 and 3 right now, obviously if you just stop looking for guys off the waiver wire, you're you're done so. You're just basically giving up at that point. But even if you're 3 and 0, I've made this mistake in the past where I've looked at my team and I'm like, "Oh my god, this thing's unstoppable. Like, I've scored number 1 in this league 3 weeks in a row. Like, how could I drop any of these guys? Like, there's no way anybody on the waiver wire at this point is going to be as good as what I already have on my team." That might be true. But at the same time, you have to put in the due diligence. You have to look at the waiver wire every single week and be like, okay, maybe there is some areas in which I can upgrade. And yeah, maybe you're playing in a league where if you're in first place, you're going to get last pick on the waiver wire anyway. But you know, there's a lot of people who don't pay attention every week and some guys follow you that you never thought you would before. So again, just kind of reiterating to everybody, you have to, have to, have to make sure that you continue to pay attention to this stuff. But I feel like most of you kind of knew that already. So I guess some of you might be asking me then like, all right, what kind of stuff are we looking for at this point? Because there is kind of a shift in terms of what you start looking for on the waiver wire at roughly about this point in the season. The first three weeks of the season is when we're 
big time adjusting to what our preconceived notions were from the off season. This might be a quarterback competition that has been settled. Think like Byron Brown or TJ Finley, where again, there's a little bit back and forth. We weren't really sure we knew who the guy was, but now we know it was important to pick them up off of a waiver wires pretty early on. There were a lot of running back rooms where we thought it was going to be a lot more split than it was. So think of like, you know, Elijah Gillum at Fresno State, Marcus Carroll at Georgia State, Nathan Carter at Michigan State, and Makai Hughes at Tulane. Those guys were important to pick up in the first couple of weeks. I mean, wide receiver ones coming out of nowhere. I mean, uh, Pofile, Ashlock, Gage, Larvidane, Eric Brooks, Lincoln Victor. Like, shoot, if you've been playing those guys the last couple of weeks, you know exactly how important those guys have been for your team there. So again, a lot of that is just like, you know, kind of cleaning up some things that we didn't quite get right early on in the season. But now we're three weeks in. We've seen most of these teams play three games, if not more than that. So we have a pretty good idea of like how each team is running. So what are we really looking for now? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, we're trying to take advantage, unfortunately, of just some injury situations around the country, whether that be at really any position there. A lot of times, a wide receiver one goes down at a school. It's pretty easy to know who the number two guy is, and you got to go off and chase after them. We'll kind of get into some of that here as well. And then maybe you have a running back room where, you know, it's a bit more split, but, you know, a couple guys start going down. That kind of brings all of the volume into just maybe one or two guys there. Um, And then also, again, not only just injuries, but just especially the quarterback situation, just changes like you know guys get wally pipped whether they get injured or you got you know guys who just performed abysmally you have another guy come in they look a lot better and suddenly a place that we thought was going to be cff relevant is back to being cff relevant because of the change they made at quarterback and again we'll touch on one or two of those here today um and then again in addition we are still kind of looking for some of those guys that are separating in crowded rooms. This is especially true at the running back position. There's a lot of teams, you know, they go into the season, they have a full committee. They're waiting to see, um, they're waiting to see who kind of breaks out in the game. Cause it's one thing to look good in practice. It's another thing to, it's another thing to, you know, actually do it out there on the field. So we're starting to see some guys that are just straight up outperforming the rest of their room. They're going to probably earn more carries down the line. And then um, the other thing is here, we're almost at that point where I kind of shift what I'm looking for in waiver wire guys. The first couple of weeks here, you've noticed I am very, very big on finding those guys that are going to have rest of season value. These are potential starters week in and week out. That's what I like to focus on in weeks one through three, maybe weeks one through four for the most part. But once you get around week three or four, that's when that kind of starts to dry up a little bit. You start to see that, you know, we, like I said, we've seen all these teams play. We know what kind of systems they're running. We know what the situations are there. Then it starts to become a bit more about matchup basis. And you'll probably see, probably starting next week, unless there's a bunch of guys that pop out of nowhere, I'm probably going to start focusing a bit more on upcoming matchups for waiver guys, not really looking for those guys who, you know, are getting, you know, 10 targets per game because there's probably not going to be any of those guys left. Again, that's just how college fantasy is. We learn who those guys are pretty early on and then we adjust. So that's kind of my little intro there. I think that's a pretty good way to go ahead and get us on over to our waiver wire talk. And as always, we're going to start negative and then we're going to go positive because we like to end on positive notes here. But we got to talk about this week's Trap players. It's a trap. Once again, these are guys under 30% that normally would, you know, be considered for waiver wire pickups. But when I dug a little bit deeper, I'm not super, super excited about them. I really don't think that they're going to perform what they did the rest of the season. So make sure you don't go and grab these guys. We'll start with the first one here. We got five guys on the list, as always. Peyton Thorne, quarterback out of Auburn. Now, He's maybe a legitimate option you can grab in a league where, you know, maybe you're starting three quarterbacks and it's like 18 to 24 teams. And so quarterbacks are super, super scarce. Yeah, go pick them up off the waiver wire. That's a whole different situation. But if you're playing in like, you know, a regular 20-man roster, three um, or two quarterback deep starting, 
Peyton Thorne, don't buy into the fool's gold here, y'all. This past week against Samford, 32 attempts, 282 yards, a touchdown, two interceptions, by the way. So, you know, not great. But here's the real, real weird thing. 11 rushing attempts for 123 yards and two touchdowns. If you went into the offseason and said and told anybody, like, oh, Peyton Thorne's going to be a rushing QB in college fantasy this year, everybody would look at you absolutely nuts. And guess what? You would still be correct to do that. Peyton Thorne's not a rushing quarterback. This is completely out of the ordinary for him. He did it against FCS competition. So again, he can out-athlete pretty much anybody out there, pretty much run around them. I am not buying into this whatsoever. You saw just the last couple of weeks when they played Cal, they weren't able to really do anything. I think a lot of the SEC competition is going to be much better than... I think it's going to be much better, obviously, than Cal, and definitely much better than Sanford. Don't buy into this. That's com- complete fool's gold. If you started Thorin this week, well done. You played the matchup well. Next two, got two guys here, extremely, extremely similar. Emmanuel Mitchell, or excuse me, Emmanuel Michelle, running back out of Air Force, and then Alex Texa, running back out of Navy. I want everybody to repeat something with me. Ready? I, I'm going to assume y'all said I back, will not chase after triple option running backs. I will not chase after triple option running backs. Guys, I've made this mistake, especially early on in playing college fantasy. I see, you know, I, I see guys break out in these triple option offenses, and I'm like, oh my God, they run the ball all the time. If this is their main guy, then I got to be all over this. I mean, especially Air Force, like, you know, Brad Roberts killed it the last couple of years. Maybe Michelle's their new guy. Don't buy it, y'all. Don't buy it. It's just a trap that you get yourself caught into. You start them the next week thinking that they're going to get the 28, 25 carries that they got the previous week. And then a new flavor of the week for that team comes out of nowhere. And then you're sitting there holding a bag of doo-doo. Just don't worry about it. Again, I don't, don't, just like TLC shouldn't go after, go chasing waterfalls. You should not be go chasing these triple option running backs. That's pretty much as simple as that. And then the next two here, big weeks for both of these guys, both um, kind of younger guys here. But, you know, they're playing in blowouts. They got in there with the second team and performed extremely, extremely well. Joe Quest Smith, the running back out of Temple, they played against some FCS competition this past week. He had himself a really, really good day. Problem is, again, it was a blowout. He got a lot of run because, you know, that's what you do when you have young guys out there. You're blowing teams out get them some reps i am not completely throw this out again i I would avoid this week but i think given the problems that temple has had running the ball the last couple of years that you know if joe quest smith does continue to run as well as he did against fcs competition you know again maybe they throw him out there against some like heatier competition once conference play gets started maybe he does become valuable but for now leave him on the way for wire see what happens there and then nick anderson the wide receiver out of oklahoma this was a full they brought him in with a second team he looked really really good against um against a downbeaten tulsa defense that you know was, was tired as all hell it's not gonna happen week to week don't think that you see yourself grabbing a Oklahoma breakout wide receiver there. So, yep. Don't worry about any of these guys. Again, Peyton Thorne, Emmanuel Mitchell, Alex Texa, Joe Quest Smith, and Nick Anderson. Avoid, avoid, avoid. Just straight up. All right. Now let's get positive. Let's go talk about some of these guys that you should be picking up. As always, got five quarterbacks, five running backs, five wide receivers, and three tight ends that we will be discussing today. Kind of, you know, in varying levels of endorsement but i'll try to be very clear about you know which ones i am super excited about we'll start with the quarterbacks here as soon as i take a sip of water all right there we go let's talk about mr timmy mclean running or i almost said running back quarterback out of UCF, I mentioned at the top of the show that one of the things you got to start paying attention for is those injuries it is starting it is Super, super important that you are up to date on player injuries as the season goes along. Know when guys go down, who's stepping up in their place. Also know when are guys expected to come back. 
you know, because if like, let's say, oh, I don't know, like, let's let's just take Alabama, for example, like if, if Jace McClellan were to go down and so Roy Dell Williams is like popping off week after week, if you don't know when Jace McClellan is supposed to come back, you could be setting yourself up for failure there because once he does come back, that could completely kill Roy Dell Williams' value there. So definitely have to be paying attention to that kind of stuff here. Anyway, back to Timmy McLean, quarterback at UCF. John Rice Plumley is out uh, for the next couple of weeks with a leg injury. So until Plumley comes back, it looks like McLean is the guy. And he does have somewhat of a similar skill set to Plumley. Like, I wouldn't call him as dynamic of a runner as Plumley, but you know, that's super relative because like Plumley might be one of the most dynamic runners at the quarterback position in the entire country. So to, to say that McLean's, you know, not quite that is not exactly like dinging this guy too much. He definitely has a rushing ability there. He's, he's gotten plenty with his feet. He's averaging almost six yards a carry so far this year. Thing is here, the only action we've really seen so far with him is against, you know, Villanova and Kent State. So two really, really bad teams. And we do have big play, big 12 play starting for UCF this week. We really don't know how well they kind of are expected to show up against these teams that have played in the Power Five for so, so long. Now, the good news is like two out of the three opponents in the next couple of weeks are looking, you know, pretty tasty in terms of their defenses. You got Baylor in two weeks and then Kansas in three weeks. Both of those teams have shown that they are not to be trusted to actually stop offensive attacks so far. So I think he'll be pretty okay with that. Kansas State, obviously, again, they they gave up 30 points to Mizzou last week. But, you know, I, I still believe in the job they mostly put on over there. I'd be a little bit skeptical there. But regardless, like, if McLean goes out and shows out against Kansas State this week, I think that, basically, if you trust, if you would have trusted Plumley in these next upcoming games, you should be able to trust McLean moving forward. He is, if you had Plumley, like, McLean's a must-grab off the waiver wire this week just to try try to keep up with what you might have gotten out of Plumley there. Like I said, obviously the rushing isn't as great, but still like last week, nine attempts, 44 yards. That's pretty solid. It also helps McLean's a better passer in my opinion. Again, 20 for 28 this past week, over 300 yards, two touchdowns. I think he's pretty solid. Rostered only 3% of teams. Like, like I said, if you had Plumley, this is a must grab, but if not, if you're looking for, you know, trying to grab the value of Plumlee because you weren't able to get him in the draft, might want to go ahead and try to target McLean this weekend. Maybe, because again, we don't, again, we know Plumlee will be out at least a few weeks, could be even longer than that. So maybe McLean's the guy moving forward. We'll see. Moving on to our next quarterback here. This is a guy that I am super, super excited about. Um, This is Braden Fowler. Nicolosi, the quarterback out of Colorado State. I put out a tweet last week that just looking at the stats, like, again, I'm fortunate I didn't really get to watch much of the game, but I did I did get to watch him this past week, and I'll get to that in a second. This offense just seemed to do much better with Nicolosi at the helm rather than Clay Millen. Like, we saw once he was kind of inserted into the lineup against Washington State, the offense just hummed much much more and again the stats here at between la- or between two weeks ago and this past week the stats kind of put or um kind of show this again millen had a 4.8 yards per attempt which is you know conservative as all hell versus fowler actually putting willing to put the ball down the field a little bit 8.7 yards per attempt and again like if you if you want to go to average depth of target millen had four yards as his average depth of target versus fowler 7.2 yards down the field like Fowler feels like the guy that we've kind of been waiting for Jay Norvell to have in this system also I should really be better about not going back and forth between Fowler and Nicolosi I'll just call him Nicolosi from this point forward anyway I got to watch him extensively this past week with you know the midnight madness that was the Colorado Colorado State game and I was super impressed with Fowler and Nicolosi for the most part. Again, obviously, Colorado's defense is really not much to write home about. But things seem to be finally clicking for this Rams offense with Nicolosi at the home. He's willing to push the ball further downfield. He's willing to take more shots. I think he's, they're willing to utilize the weapons just a little bit more. 
And they kind of showed that they this coaching staff trusts him to pass a ton this past week with a lead for most of the game, I might add. 47 passing attempts last week. And the best part, he force-fed the guys that you would want him to. Torrey Horton, Dallin Holker, um, Justice Ross Simmons. Didn't get a ton of run this past week, but, you know, like, he had him the week before. And then Louis Brown the fourth was kind of a breakout guy from this past week. Those four guys right there, you funnel feed those those guys right there, I think you will continue to see success with him in this system. And the best part about this is the schedule sets up beautifully over the next couple of weeks. They got MTSU next week. They got Utah Tech the week after. They got Utah State afterwards. According to CGC Winning Edge, the entire rest of the season, they have the 17th easiest schedule in the country. So, you know, there's there's kind of worry that like, oh, maybe maybe they do well against really bad competition, but then, you know, they slow down against really good competition well this past week again they not only performed well against colorado they almost threw or they threw for over 350 yards like i think that this passing attack is going to be much more effective with nicolosi at the helm and he provides an incredible safe floor quarterback moving forward hopefully we see even more scoring than we have from the last couple of weeks there I think he'll be an excellent, excellent floor play. Again, rostered only 1% of leagues. He's available everywhere. So if you're in desperate need of finding that next guy for your team, this is your dude. Or if, if you're in like completely, de- if you're in desperate need for some floor plays at quarterback, Nicolas is your guy. Anyway, speaking of floor plays, uh, this next guy, not a guy like I'm super impressed by in terms of, you know, just the overall talent or anything like that, but. Man, consistency is what you need in college fantasy sometimes. And surprisingly, Haynes King is providing just that. Rostered on 20% of league so far, he is Mr. Consistent so far. Week 1 against Louisville, 29.82 fantasy points. Week 2, 27.6. Week 3, 30.48. Just super, super consistent on a week-by-week basis. I mean, that's, there's there's a, just a ton of value in that. Just knowing you can plug in a guy. He's gone against some easy matchups, gone against some tougher matchups. He seems to perform really no matter what. And in the tougher matchups, he uses his legs quite a bit more. Again, against Louisville, 10 carries, 53 yards. Against Ole Miss this past week, 14 attempts for 42 yards. Got himself a touchdown there. He pretty much seems so far locked into three touchdowns per week so far during this season. Again, the running backs, have, nobody's really kind of broken out there. So once they get down near the goal line, seems like King is the guy expected to kind of put it into the end zone. I mentioned kind of early on, or not early on, but like during the off season, I mentioned that with Buster Faulkner there, a Todd Monken style offense, which is what Buster Faulkner, Faulkner is expected, is running, a style of offense like that that is forced to score could be really, really fun for CFF. Now, again, just like at Georgia, you know, the ball's being spread around. We haven't really had a number one wide receiver, like, truly emerge there, although Rutherford's looking pretty good. King is benefiting all from that. Again, they're throwing the ball a ton. Again, he has had over 29 attempts in all three of his games. I expect once they get into more ACC play that they are absolutely going to probably hit 30, 35 plus throws every single game here. That's kind of the problem, though, is that we do kind of a relatively tough schedule for Georgia Tech moving forward. I mean, look look at their like looking upon their future opponents. You got teams like Miami. You got Virginia, Clemson, Clemson and Georgia within the last three weeks of the season. Obviously, very, very rough. But for the most part, like, the week-to-week schedule here, like, again, they play Wake Forest this upcoming week. Then you got Bowling Green. Then you got Miami, Boston College, North Carolina, Virginia. These are all teams that have shown they can be scored upon. So I think for the most part, he'll be pretty all right, even though those defenses are, you know, can be a little touch-and-go sometimes. I think, again... Once again, if you're looking for a very safe floor play, maybe you drafted a guy like Frank Harris and you're sitting there like, oh God, where um, where am I going to get some value out of quarterback? Hayes King, available in 80% of leagues. You can probably go and grab him. 
Next quarterback here, let's talk about Keon Jenkins, quarterback out of FIU. Talked about last week how much the quarterback change at FIU has done wonders for them in their passing game, but I guess now is really time to talk about the quarterback that they changed to. Once again, pretty solid consistency here, both through the air and on the ground. 280 plus passing yards in the last three games, averaging 30 passes in all three games, and eight plus rushing attempts in every game. Just a very safe volume floor right there of just expecting him to be involved in 38 plus plays per game there. They got a super easy schedule moving forward. You got Louisiana, or um, again, they've already faced Louisiana Tech, Maine, North Texas, and Yukon. But then after that, Liberty, New Mexico State, UTEP, Sam Houston, Jackson State, or Jacksonville State, Middle Tennessee State, Arkansas, Western Kentucky. Arkansas is a little bit rough there at the very end, but for the most, other than that, like, where are you sitting, Jenkins? Again, he's got some dual threat ability, very safe floor play here. Not going to really talk too much here. Again, just, that's kind of been a theme I've noticed throughout all of the quarterbacks here today. Just a lot of safe floor guys, except for maybe McLean. Um, Because again, all of these guys are pretty much averaging right around that, you know, 25 to 30 point range that you can plug them into your lineup. You know, you know, you're going to get a solid, you get two of these guys. You're going to get a solid 50 points out of your quarterback position. You're kind of good to go there. Then last but not least here, this is the quarterback that I'm probably least confident in for this week. But if I told you that Nebraska had played somebody at quarterback last week that pretty much provides all of the same value that Jeff Sims would have done, except he doesn't find a way to turn the ball over stupidly three to four times a game. You know, you'd be pretty interested in that, and I'm interested here. Again, we got Heinrich Harburg, the quarterback on Nebraska. Came in very late against the game, Colorado. Obviously didn't perform super well there, but man, look at these rushing numbers. 21 attempts this past week for 98 yards and a touchdown. You know, passing, super limited for the most part. It seems like 14 for 24, less than 200 yards. Did get two touchdowns, but that again, this is against uh, Northern Illinois here. Obviously, you would want the passing to be a little bit better there so you can feel better about yourself as a floor week to week here. But, you know, when you got rushing like this, that is super valuable floor right there. I think, once again, I've kind of said this with Kate on Salter a couple weeks ago. Anybody who, any quarterback that has the upside of rushing 20 plus times in a game, that's a guy that you're going to, you're going to want to, you know, take a look at for your team. I know for a fact I'm putting in some waiver claims for Harburg this week in some t- in some leagues where I'm deeply, deeply struggling at quarterback. So you know, um, but the only thing is the main again. This is why I'm like super hesitant because like with Kate on Salter, you know, they're playing in CUSA. It is you know, a baby conference right there. Then uh, not so much with Nebraska. You got the Big Ten conference. Harbor could be really, really fun against LA Tech this weekend. That's kind of their last out-of-conference game there. Should be a ton of fun. They should be able to put up some points there. But then Michigan comes to town. And then you got to go on the road to Illinois the following week. Again, it's just this Big Ten schedule is definitely making me queasy about moving forward with Harburg. But again, with rushing volume like that, it's kind of hard to ignore. Again, he's the least comfortable guy that I am putting out here for you guys this week. But, you know. All right, to finish up the quarterbacks here, I'll throw out some honorable mentions. These are guys we've mentioned here before that are, you know, either still under 30% or, you know, still widely available. Thomas Castellanos, TJ Finley, they both had incredible weeks this past week. You guys should probably pick them up by now. And then Kadon Salter. Y'all told y'all this would be the last week that you're able to get him. If he is still available in your league, he is not going to be there next week after this past week's performance. So what are y'all waiting for? Anyway... Now it's time to move on to some running backs. And I think out of the three major positions, this is probably the one that is, I would say, the strongest. Like the last couple of weeks, we've had some really, really strong wide receiver groups. I think the running back group this week might be the strongest waiver wire pickups for the week. So we'll get into some of those guys once I take my break and take a sip of water here. Okay, I appreciate you guys on that. Anyway, let's talk about our first running back here. I think this might be our only Power 5 running back here that we are talking about. Yes, oh, nope, never mind. I got one one at the very end because I forget that, that team is Power 5 sometimes. Anyway, Imani Bailey, running back out of TCU, rostered on 24% of leagues. 
It's been a couple weeks, but I think we can safely say that Amani Bailey has become TCU's featured back. I I was big on Trey Sanders during the offseason. I liked where he was going in a lot of drafts, but he just hasn't really performed super well so far this season. He's very much kind of been pigeonholed into a role of, you know, we're fourth and one, we need one yard, get out there and get it for us, Sanders. Versus Amani Bailey, like down to down. This is the guy that they are relying on. This is the guy they're expecting explosive plays out of. This is the guy they're giving the volume to. So far this year, he's out carrying Trey Sanders 2-1 to one in carries and is way outperforming him in average yards per carry. He's got six, or Bailey's got 6.4 yards per carry versus Trey Sanders only has 3.8 yards per carry. And then this past week, Sanders out carried or excuse me bailey out carried sanders 23 carries to eight so almost a three to one ratio in terms of where this volume is getting split up it seems like bailey is just kind of quickly approaching that kendra miller role that tcu had last year and sanders is just kind of fading a little bit more and more um, and I think Bailey might even become more important than Miller was because, you know, the Horned Frogs can't be reliant on the passing game as much with Morris at QB as, they, as much as they were with Duggan. Like, if that's the case, then Bailey's about to head off for an absolutely super year at the running back position because, just a reminder for everybody, Kendry Miller finished as the running back 18 in college fantasy last year. Here's my only concern with Imani Bailey. And again, like this is probably the reason why people haven't really picked him up. Again, he's only had one touchdown through three games so far. That touchdown opportunity is kind of a bit of a concern. Bailey seems to be that kind of between the 20s guy for the most part. And then they bring in Trey Sanders to get that tough yardage near the end after Bailey's kind of been worn out on the drive. But like I said, as Bailey continues to kind of show how reliable he is for the coaching staff and they continue to give him as, as much opportunity as possible... I think he's going to start earning some of those, some more of those goal line carries. And we saw him get, um, or excuse, not even goal line carries, but those red zone carries. We saw him get some of those this past week. I think he's going to continue to improve in that. Bailey might be the most important running back that you pick up off the waiver wire this week if he is still available in your league. So be on the lookout for that. Next up, let's talk about Mr. LJ. Martin, running back at a BYU. We always love seeing true freshman running backs breaking out this, this early on in the season. Sorry, Aiden Robbins. Um, your chance seems to have come and passed, sadly. Um, LJ Martin just has been the best all-around back for the Cougars just by a really, really good bit. Um, I mean, Robbins has been dealing with some injuries in the fall camp and everything, so that probably keeps him from being 100%. But... You know, the, the staff has to do what the staff has to do, and Martin has been out carrying Robbins 45 carries to 10 carries on the season. And when it comes to just on a down-per-down down basis, Martin averaging 4.3 yards per carry versus Robbins averaging 1.6 yards per carry. And by the way, there's not a single running back on BYU's roster that comes even close to that 4.3 yards per carry that LJ Martin is doing so far. I think... He is in for a massive, massive year down the line. Passing game's pretty limited. Again, they've only had about 220 yards per game. Martin has been just providing the juice this offense needs when things keep stalling out. We saw it against Sam Houston in week one where he got 16 carries for 91 yards. And then this past week in the shootout against Arkansas, 23 carries, 77 yards, and two touchdowns. The fact that the coaching staff seems to turn to Martin in these like higher stakes, closer games tells me everything I need to know about his role moving forward. This is a guy that the coaching staff absolutely trust i think he will be your next great byu running back again he'll probably have some up and down games because that's just what true freshmen do and like we've seen what byu has done in recent history when it comes to what happens when they have a number one running back just go back to 2021 when tyler algier finishes the rb7 in college fantasy when this staff finds their back they ride with him and martin is him so far it's a chance that you really can't pass up as much. Very similar to Darius Taylor last week. I don't think this is going to be a situation where you want to sit around and wait to see what happens. Meanwhile, somebody else has already picked him up, and now they got a guy who's going to get 20, 25 carries in this BYU system. 
Next running back here, let's go to some Mac app, Mac app, Mac action. Oh my goodness. You know what? I'm never saying that again. We're going to just keep it to Mac action. Let's talk about some action. I'm slightly hesitant on this play because I'm kind of truly worried about how bad Kent State is. But it's kind of hard to ignore what Gavin Garcia has been doing as the main running back for Kent State the last couple of weeks in terms of his volume. Again, this three weeks ago against UCF, 18 carries for 45 yards. You know, not great. 2.5 yards per carry. Ew, gross. But, you know, they're playing up the competition. Next week against Arkansas, 18 carries, 68 yards. You know, once again, kind of blah, under four yards per carry. But once again, they're playing up to competition. Then they play against uh, Central Connecticut this past weekend. They're playing down to competition now. 21 carries, 125 yards, and two touchdowns. Obviously, it's kind of really hard to gauge what he's going to do with or in terms, like, what is his production going to look like once they start getting into action? But one thing seems to be constant. They're going to get this dude 18 to 22 carries per game. They're going to get, they're going to feed him quite a bit of volume every single game, and that's just what you want to see in action. Because like, once those games get started, we know from history that anything could happen. We could have a final score of 10 to 13. But we could also have a sc- final score of 52 to 50. Like, it is absolutely, absolutely crazy. And, like, you just have to run that possibility when you get to max it here. And the safe bet is always, always the volume, guys. Now, Garcia, the main kind of drawback here is so far, in blow- even in blowouts, no receiving work whatsoever. It doesn't seem like they plan to throw him the ball whatsoever. He and I have the same number of targets and receptions in college in college football this year, and, and that's to say zero, zilch, nada. So again, Gar- Garcia is definitely one to pick up this week. Again, rostered on two percent of rosters, but he's not one to start. I mean, you got Fresno State this next upcoming week. I think that they'll handle Kent State pretty well, given how well they performed so far. But after that. Kent State's action schedule actually sets up really, really well. I mean, you start off with Miami of Ohio and then actually Ohio, and then they don't have Toledo on the schedule, which is by a good margin, we think, the number one defense in the MAC this year. So they avoid that. Again, Kent State gets into a couple of shootouts with some of these MAC teams. Garcia is definitely going to be a guy that you're going to want to have just kind of sitting on your roster ready to go if he starts breaking out a few games into the conference play there. So definitely keep an eye out there. Let's move on to our next running back, K. Ron Adams, running back out of UMass. This dude's had an impressive, impressive last couple of weeks here. Again, they've already played four games on the season. Um, But again, we know UMass has had number one running backs in the past. Just go back a couple years ago when you had a guy named Ellis Merriweather just absolutely tear it up for the Minutemen. When UMass is comfortable with a guy, they're going to feed the hell out of him, and Adam seems to be that guy this year. Um, Again, past couple of weeks, 15 carries, 14 carries, 16 carries, but you've also had two performances in there of 100-plus yards, including against Auburn. When they played against Auburn, again, 101 yards on 14 carries. This dude is legitimately good, and you can see why UMass is wanting to utilize him pretty well here i think that for the most part if you pick him up he's a very safe floor option guy every single week here i mean just look at what he's been able to do he has not had a game under 10 points so far this year again obviously you're probably looking for a little bit more there but again as a safe guy as in like a guy you know is not going to completely bust out on you i think adams is a pretty solid pickup there and again looking ahead at their schedule you kind of it provides pretty clear choices in terms of when you're probably going to start him and then when you're probably going to sit him. Like, look at the next three schedule. New Mexico, I'll probably start him. Arkansas State, probably going to start him. Against Toledo, probably going to have some pretty limited scoring opportunities in this in that game, so I'm probably going to hold off on that. There's some value in that. So I think Karen Adams is a fun little waiver wire pickup. And the last running back we have here will be Mr. Kyle Manungai. Me and... Uh, J- Justin, aka Volume Picks, discussed him a little bit this past week on our Sit Start show. 
it's time for me to go ahead and put him here on the waiver wire pickup. This is the Kirk Soraka system. He's been at Minnesota the last couple of years. They usually feed one guy that breaks um, throughout the season. And it looks like that Manung guy might be that guy. I wanted it to be Samuel Brown the fifth. But, you know, injuries are a butt. And Manung guy is actually taking advantage of his opportunity so far. Um, got two games in a row so far with over 100 yards rushing and a touchdown in those games. I mean, last week he had 26 carries. This week... He had only 16, but regardless, again, he's performing well there. They're getting him the goal line touches. The kind of the major thing here is that you have to know when to play Manungai. When Rutgers is in games that they can actually win, Manungai is absolutely a play. And that's what I said this past week on the sit start when somebody asked, like, oh, is this actually going to be a thing? Because, you know, they've kind of been going back and forth in terms of who's getting the carries every single week. And I said, well, as long as as long as the game's supposed to be close or Rutgers is ahead, Banunga is going to be that dude. But this next upcoming week against Michigan, I'm not so sure about that. I definitely would sit him this week if you were to pick him up off the waiver wire. But again, when they are expected to be competitive, seems like the floor for Banunga so far this season is about 15-ish opportunities per game. And we saw that the ceiling is around 28 touches in that game. So I think he's absolutely worth picking up, especially if you're struggling at running back, you know, had a couple of duds, a couple of injuries. I think he's definitely somebody to take a look out there for. Uh, a couple of quick reminders and honorable mentions here. Darius Taylor is the main reminder here again, y'all. He's that dude. He's the dude for Minnesota moving forward. We saw it again this past week. They were willing to feed him the rock against North Carolina. I, it, it, I just go grab him right now. Like it's the Minnesota lead running back. They're moving back to the heavy rush attack. He could be an absolute league winner by the end of the year. And then one per- one person that again I kind of went back and forth whether I would be including them on the show or not is Jalen Lucas, the running back out of Indiana. I'm still not fully ready to endorse Lucas because I still don't quite trust his volume. Again, he's last two games he's at eight carries and ten carries, but you know he is able to receive out of the backfield. Shoot, this past week he had 10 targets out of the backfield. So you like to see that, but he hadn't had that before that point. So it's not like a consistent week-to-week thing. I'm at the point where, like, if you are a believer in Lucas, yeah, go grab him off the waiver wire. Uh, I don't blame you for going after his explosiveness. That's kind of the main selling point of him is that he's going to break a long one pretty much any game, it seems like. But... For the most part, I'm probably going to avoid him in most of my leagues. But like I said, I don't blame you if you go after him. All right, let's move on to the wide receivers here. Let me take a swig of water. All right. Let's talk about the wide receivers here. This first one blows my mind that his roster ship is so low. Robert Lewis, wide receiver out of Georgia State, rostered in 13% of leagues. Literally, how? How? How is this dude below 15% roster, let alone the 30% threshold that I give to him? We know that Darren Granger loves himself a wide receiver one. We know that Jamari Thrash finishes the wide receiver 22 last year. And shoot, his breakout didn't even come until later down the season. So far, Robert Lewis is that guy. 22 targets through three games. You know, not volume we love to see, but it's clear that he has been the Panthers' go-to guy in situations where they need it. He's been the big play threat for them so far. I think that, again, there's really not much to say here. Again, just look at his performances the past week. He's going to have massive, massive games in this season. 220 yards, two touchdowns against Charlotte. The schedule sets up really, really nicely for Georgia State moving forward. They got Coastal Carolina, Troy, Marshall. Troy's a little bit tougher, um, but, you know, I given Lewis's big big playability. I think he'll still be fine there for the most part. Again, Lewis is in that same role that Jamari Thrash was in last year. He'll continue to be dominant on most weeks. This is a dude that you need to be picking up off the waiver wire. Kind of simple as that. Would not be shocked at all if he's a top 20 wide receiver by year's end. Let's move on to the next wide receiver. In my opinion, these the, the two wide receivers I'm talking about first are kind of a tier of their own, like as pretty much, in my opinion, must grabs off the waiver wire if they are available. And then the next three, there's a bit more kind of hesitancy. There's a little bit more, you know, I'm like, I, I like these guys, but I'm not like 
saying like go grab them in every single league drop a former stud or anything like that anyway back to this this is a stud and this is a dude that i think will be heavily heavily influential on college fantasy down the line mr colin lacy wide receiver out of south alabama we love our systems in the college fantasy community and the south alabama wide receiver one has been good to us in the past i mean just look at jalen tolbert in wide receiver who finished as the wide receiver six in 2021 Last year was a little bit of a mess. Part of the reason why I was very hesitant when it came to Colin Lacey and why I was a bit more on Devin Voison, mostly because, again, Colin Lacey, I, I thought he kind of had his chance already and he didn't really take it by the reins versus Voison looked really good down the stretch for South Alabama. But then we get into this year and... Uh, like, we were hoping that Devin Voison would be that guy, but not only did he disappoint through two games... But his inj- he, he's now out for the year with a torn ACL. That leaves Colin Lacey, who up until this point in his career, like I said, he hasn't, has not been able to take the opportunity to be the wide receiver one by the horns. However, he seems to have found his groove this year. Like Even before Voison's injury, he was outproducing Voison, and now with Voison down, that provides even more opportunity for Lacey to be that true number one guy. 25 targets through three games. The next closest person on the team has 13. I honestly expect that per game number to go up as the season moves along here. I think that he is earning more and more targets with each game. I fully expect him to be a guy that's earning 10 plus targets per game as the season goes along. And again, like his yard, again, go on, rewind, go back. I expect him to be earning more and more targets, especially with the fact that he has 13.4 yards per catch after the reception. He's a very, very enticing target for Carter Bradley in every single game. Voicing, you know, that's a guy you got to throw down the field. You got to throw those 50-50 balls. Those are the throws you get a little queasy about sometimes. Versus like Lacey, his A dot is not super far down the field. If I remember correctly off the top of my head, it was less than six yards down the field. So he's not being targeted super deep. But again, would you know on average every time that you that you get the ball in this guy's hand, he's gonna earn 13.4 yards after that reception? That is immensely, immensely favorable to quarterbacks and makes you want to target them. Short throws for big gains is a QB's best friend, and I think Colin Lacey is turning that into an absolute CFF monster machine right there. So that's why I'm big on Lacey. I think he'll be huge down the stretch. Probably one of the last guys you're going to be able to get this season that is consistently going to be getting those you know, 10-plus target games moving forward. Next guy up here. I touched on Kadon Salter earlier and how big he's been, and we can we can tell by now that with the CUSA schedule, that Liberty's offense is going to be very very hot this year for college fantasy. Given how much they're going to score, it just makes sense to try to invest in who they're throwing the ball to. Because again, Kadon Salter's got pretty decent volume there, tons of explosive plays all over the field. But the problem is for Liberty is they don't really have one single standout at wide receiver, but really a bunch of good options. Out of the kind of the main three who have performed so well so far, I'm going to suggest CJ Daniels as the guy that you invest in. That's who I have up here on the board. Again, rostered in 5% of leagues this past week. Seven targets, four perceptions, 106 yards, and a touchdown. Here's, here's kind of why I'm going with Daniels over um, some of the other options for them. First of all, he leads the team in yards per reception at 25.2. So clearly tons of explosive plays going on with him. He's tied for the for first in the number of targets. And like I said, he's being targeted well down the field. His average depth of target is over 20 yards. <clears throat> Again, the volume is not really what I want to see so far this year. You're talking about maybe five, six targets per game so far through the season. But like I said, the explosive plays just have been there for him. Again, over 20 yards down the field, averaging over 25.2 yards per perception. That's pretty solid. Probably going to come down a little bit as the season goes along. But he's one of those guys where you don't need a ton of opportunities for him to score well for you in fantasy. And the other part of it is, 
let's run through the schedule for Liberty. You guys tell me where the obvious sit is. Which game is CJ Daniels not going to be capable of hitting multiple explosive plays on the schedule? Because I'm looking at it and I legit cannot find it. You got FIU, got Sam Houston, you got Jacksonville State, you got MTSU, you got Western Kentucky, you got Louisiana Tech, Old Dominion, Massachusetts, and UTEP. Legitimately, if you are relying on CJ Daniels on a week by week basis because of his explosive ability, which week of, are you sitting him? Because I don't see a week where you're wanting to fade this Liberty offense. So if you're grabbing CJ Daniels because you need wide receiver help, the best part, in my opinion, is that you're probably looking at him being startable pretty much every single week if you need him to slide into your lineup. So that's where the value of CJ Daniels comes in. Let's go ahead and move on to our fourth wide receiver option here. This is Mr. Jack Hestera, the wide receiver out of Charlotte. I will admit, I am kind of projecting here and probably basing a little bit too much on one game. I've warned you guys about chasing points, but I'm going to kind of make a case as to why I think Hestera's performance this past week, which by the way was 10 targets for 7 receptions, 109 yards and a touchdown and he is rostered in literally ignore the graphic i forgot to change that he's he's rostered in zero percent of leagues why do i think that this is actually a sign of things to come well just like with uh florida international a quarterback change can really do wonders for an offense and jalen jones while his dual threat ability has definitely been enticing his 1.6 yards per attempt to start the game last week was quickly benched in favor of one Trexler Ivy. Now, Ivy is not a dual threat guy whatsoever. In fact, he ended the day with negative yards, but th- he threw for more yards in one game than Jalen Daniels was able to in two. And this was a pretty massive benefit to Jack Hestera. Hestera before this point, was kind of already commanding about a third of the very limited passing target share before this game. But then when you bring in um, Trexler Ivy here and the coaches are more inclined to pass the ball around because they trust Ivy to do so, suddenly when you go from having you know, 14, 15 pass attempts per game to 28, his target share went from about four to five targets to 10 targets in this past game, still earning about one third of those passing attempts. That doubled, like I said, it doubled his target numbers from the previous game. Charles in pretty rough shape. Um, I think they're going to be quite, they're going to be behind in quite a few games. If Hester is really that kind of go-to guy for this Charlotte passing attack, I think he'll have some really, really good weeks down the stretch and benefit even more from that game script. There's a couple tough games ahead, so it's going to be a little difficult to truly gauge like how valuable he is because, again, I'm not going to take much out of his performance against Florida this upcoming week. But, you know, nothing really impossible that he can't do pretty well. Again, if he continues to kind of command a, a third of the target share for this Charlotte team... I think we have the potential for a pretty good volume pig here to use uh, Justin's terminology. I think there's a very big potential that Hestera could be a potential volume pig down the line. Again, it's going to be tough to kind of evaluate over the next couple of weeks, but I want to kind of throw his name out there pretty early on here. And I think once he gets to conference play, it'll probably be very, very good for him. We'll definitely see. Last wide receiver I'm going to talk about here is Mr. Malik Washington, wide receiver out of Virginia, rostered on 2% of leagues. Speaking of quarterbacks that make a huge, or excuse me, speaking of quarterback changes that make a huge difference, um, how about Virginia's offense with uh, true freshman Anthony Calandrea? Like, obviously, you know, throwing three interceptions this past week was not great, but, you know, freshman. But, you know, Virginia's offense looked awful against Tennessee and Tennessee as we've seen now is really not that great when it comes to defense like we thought they were early on and so we bring in Colin Drea and now all of a sudden in the last two matchups Virginia's thrown for 250 in both of their matchups and shoot they went for 377 
against James Madison. With this increased passing volume, the, the good news is that they're really funneling it to two guys, which is Malik Washington and Malachi Fields. Malachi Fields has 30 targets so far. Malik Washington has 28. Now, you might be asking me, Jared, well, if Malachi Fields is getting more targets. Like, why are you recommending Malik Washington? It basically boils down to that Washington's just kind of a bigger threat on a play-by-play basis. And very similar to Colin Lacey, his yards after the catch ability definitely outperforms Malachi Fields. You have Washington with 131 yards after the catch so far versus Malachi Fields only 58. That ability to create on average per reception seven yards after you touch the ball makes me believe that as the season goes along, Malik Washington is going to be that guy that they're going to rely on just a little bit more as the kind of safer short throw option, kind of increasing that volume as the season goes along here. But again, you'll see here when I talk about my honorable mentions, I think Malachi Fields is a legit pickup as well. The biggest concern I have is that Virginia really does not seem super interested in passing the ball to get touchdowns. Once they get in that red zone, they kind of shut down. They go to Kobe Pace and the running back room, and they let them score versus you know Malik Washington and Fields. The two of them have one combined touchdown between the two of them so far through three games. So that's definitely a little off-putting, but you know, when you have, you know, this past week, Washington had 13 targets and 141 yards. When you have that level of production, same with Sam Brown, the touchdowns are going to come eventually. Now, obviously it didn't work out for Sam Brown so far because Donovan Smith looks absolutely abysmal at quarterback for Houston, but we'll definitely see. A couple honorable mentions at wide receiver. Again, I'll bring up uh, Xavier Henderson again for Cincinnati. When the going got tough, Henderson started getting targeted again. Obviously, goes up and down a little bit there. But, you know, 11 receptions this past weekend. I think Henderson, I think last week was a bit of a fluke for Cincinnati in terms of him not getting the ball a ton. Maybe Pitt was able to shut him down quite a bit this past week. Henderson was back to his normal self. Uh, Jordan Watkins, wide receiver at Ole Miss, with Trey Harris and Zachary Franklin out for the Rebels. I think Watkins can definitely make a splash in college fantasy most weeks. I mentioned Malachi Fields already. I already talked a little bit about uh, Louis Brown, the fourth, the wide receiver at Colorado State. He looked really, really good in this past week's game against Colorado. So I would definitely be interested in him if I'm struggling at wide receiver, maybe. And then the last one here, we talked about him, I uh, believe, last week, but Xavier Leggett, the wide receiver out of South Carolina. Juice Wells unfortunately injured himself again this week in Georgia, scoring the one touchdown there. But we saw again, once he's out, Leggett just getting peppered, target after target after target. Rattler has performed extremely well so far this season. It's been a very consistent passing game for South Carolina. Leggett, as long as as long as Wells is out, Leggett's gonna get plenty of volume every single week, and he absolutely should be somebody on your rosters. All right, that's it over for the honorable mentions. Last but not least, let's go and touch on our tight ends here. Of course, after I take a swig of water. Ah, there we go. And let's talk about a couple of guys here that are right on that thirty percent roster ship that I kind of use as my cutoff for talking about different guys, making sure, obviously, that they're widely available. But quite frankly, given what's happened this year with most anchor tight ends, it's all the more important. Like, I'm not kidding when I say the next two guys that I'm going to talk about here might become the most important guys you pick up off the waiver wire this week just because of the positional advantage you might be gaining out of them. Given what's happened with the injury luck we've gotten at most of our anchor tight ends this year. I mean, Bowers, he's banged up, can't really do what he normally does. Gadsden out for the year. Lachey on crutches. Keithy, we still don't know when he's really going to come back. So grabbing some of these guys I'm about to talk about is all the more important. And the number one guy here is a guy that I have to pat myself on the back a little bit because I was super in on this guy. I literally looked at all my leagues and just saw the absurd number of them in which I had this man rostered. But Dallin Holker, 
tight end out of Colorado State, rostered on 29% of leagues. I'm pretty sure I account for about 28% of that. I said my piece during the offseason a ton, so if you've been listening to this program, you know exactly pretty much what I'm about to say. It's all coming to fruition. When Jay Norvell has a dynamic pass-catching tight end, he uses and abuses that man. We saw what he did with Cole Turner. Dallin Holker, not happy at BYU given the amount or the really the lack of passing volume that he was getting over there. That tells me that he is going somewhere where they were going to pass him the ball a ton. And guess what? That's exactly what they're doing at Colorado State through two weeks. In two weeks, he's gotten two touchdowns. So obviously a red zone target. He has the highest average depth of target on the team. So this is very clearly a guy that they're willing to push the ball down the field for. He's an absolute weapon for them. There's really not much else to say. Given what, again, like I said, given what's happened to all of our top guys, this is the guy to replace them. I, or, yeah, again, he may not have, you know, tw- obviously he's not going to probably have 20 points every single week. He's probably, he may not even have like a Cole Turner season here, but he's the best opportunity you have for it, except for maybe this other guy who I'll throw out here. And that is Tanner Cozio, tight end out of Ball State, rostered in 29% of leagues right now. A lot of you who are who've been listening since the offseason are probably listening to me and being like, "Oh, Jared, you said that you weren't in on Cozy all this year. You were, you were gonna avoid him." Well, yeah, that's because that's before Brady Hunt got hurt, and as long as Hunt's out, Cozy is the man. And quite frankly, the closest thing you're gonna be able to find to a weekly starter at tight end off the waiver wire, outside of Holker. So far, he leads his team in targets and is not particularly close. Again, I believe he has 22 targets compared to the number two wide receiver or the number two receiving option, I think, has like 13 to 15. So he's he's outproducing them by a pretty good amount. And quite frankly, again, he's he's proven me wrong on one of my talking points from last year. He's performing much better last year than he's performing this year much better than he did last year. Last year. He was only bringing in 53.8% of the balls thrown his way. I thought that was going to lead to them moving away from him and focusing solely on Brady Hunt because he was the more reliable guy. But Kosiel this year is bringing in 81.8% of his balls. And it's not like Ball State hasn't been playing tough competition. He has been performing pretty solid against the likes of Georgia, against the likes of Kentucky. And even better, like, again, he's performed well so far this season, and his value hasn't been really buoyed by a bunch of touchdowns like it was last year. He's only got one touchdown so far this year. Quite frankly, this is kind of where the hot take might come in. I wouldn't be surprised if and when Hunt comes back that Koziel still doesn't give up that tight end one spot. I think he's proven to the staff this year that he's making that next step. He's a year older. They're more, they can be more reliable on him. He probably offers the higher upside at the tight end position comparatively between the two. I think even when Hunt comes back, Koziel is still going to be the number one guy on this team, making him easily one of the more valuable tight end assets out there right now that, you know, isn't Brock Bowers or really anybody really because everybody keeps getting hurt. Last guy we'll talk about here, Mr. Thomas Fedone, tight end out of Nebraska. I'll be real, this one is a big tier drop below the other two, but it is something I am paying attention to with the improved quarterback play. You got a former number one overall tight end in the 2021 class. Hopefully he can get unleashed a little bit more moving forward. We saw this year that he's already hauled in two touchdowns. So clearly when they get to the red zone, they see him as a weapon that provides a pretty safe floor on a week by week basis in terms of what you can expect on him. But kind of similar to when we talked about um, Heinrich Harburg earlier, the big 10 schedule is tough. I'm not sure what his scoring opportunity is going to look like. And he's not the most explosive guy in the world, but you know, like again, we're struggling at tight end this year in CFF because, you know, the CFF gods have not been kind to us in terms of all those injuries. I'm just kind of throwing him out there as like, you know, if you're if you miss out on Holker, you miss out on Koziel, probably throw in your last waiver claim on Fedone, you know, just in case you aren't able to get one of those guys. I think he'll pretty 
pretty solid for you on a week in and week out basis. All righty. Well, we are right about an hour. That was kind of my goal here for the day. So we're going to move it on back and we're going to finish up for you guys here. Really, really appreciate you guys tuning in. Again, I've, I've, been, I've kind of been enjoying doing these waiver wire shows just by myself. It kind of provides me a little bit of opportunity to really kind of just go fully in depth, give myself a little bit more time to provide all my thoughts on these guys. And yeah, I, I hope you guys have been enjoying that as well. Again, make sure that if you're listening to this, that you check out our sit start show this Wednesday with myself and Justin from Volume Pigs. And we've had a great time every single week. If you haven't already, go and check out the at Chasing the Natty Twitter, where there is likely already up a post asking for sit and start questions for this week. We take those every week until Tuesday at noon Eastern Standard Time. So if you're listening to this Monday morning, you haven't put those in yet, go do that right now or during your lunch break. But until then, really appreciate you guys listening, and I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful week until I see you guys again on Wednesday. See y'all.